So every piece of technology, no matter how small or big or gigantic, has some kind of backstory behind it. You know, someone somewhere was pissed off about something. That's how like most of things starts. Um, and this story is not going to be an exception. You know, so. But before we get about things that I'm un unhappy, with, let's kind of like have a small background of where it all began. So for me, my first experience with programming was Pascal. And it was my first programming language. And I actually still think it's kind of was the first language to do a lot of things right. It had a very fast compiler. It was uh, low level, but it still it wasn't possible to easily shoot yourself. So if you want to shoot yourself, you had to be really explicit about it. Like all the things in Pascal, because it was like the most verbose language I've ever used in my life. Um, but this kind of explicit verbosity had something nice about it because it was really, really hard to do something horribly wrong. After that, um, I learned C. And it was really fun. I could type so much code like immediately, like compared to Pascal that like had all these like long keywords, I could just take curly brace and just my code would just happen, you know. Uh, it was still low level, but at the same time, it was completely different experience because it was just so easy to shoot yourself. And when I say shoot yourself, you just basically just blow parts of your body away. It's just it's not just your average, just like hurt yourself kind of way. Um, after that, I, I learned C sharp. C sharp was my first uh, object oriented, and when I say object oriented, I mean class oriented language. Um, everything is a class, um, but luckily they still have structs. And not many people know, but they still have pointers and they, uh, for cases when you need them to. So C sharp was actually a pretty good language, but it had one kind of like fatal issue, you know. It was tied to Microsoft of the old days when they were still against my, uh, open source and everything. So it felt really kind of dangerous uh, to stay in this, in this ecosystem where it only runs on Windows, you cannot run it on Linux, you cannot run it anywhere else but Windows. So again, um, something was wrong, so next language. Next language was Python. Uh, Python, you know, it was my first truly dynamic language and it felt like I had so much freedom. I, I could like do really anything about everything. I could just generate types at runtime. I could uh, do whatever I wanted, basically. Just, it was really fun to write code, but it was really hard to maintain it afterwards. And I say it as a guy who kind of just wrote a simple 20k lines of code app in, in Python, and it was impossible to refactor. It was impossible to do anything with it after you wrote it. But right then, it was fun, so there is that. Uh, uh, also in Python, I think one of the big issues in the uh, community is kind of not acknowledging um, threads uh, and DIL as an issue. And it was kind of like s scary to stay there. And it was also not very fast. You could do uh, fast things with C API, but it was like C API, like it had all of the issues with uh, C I discussed before. So again, um, I was looking for something better. And I think. Uh, the person that introduced me to Scala was Daniel Spivak with his uh, talk about hierarchical types. Uh, at the time, I was just a Python developer. I could not comprehend what was going on. <laughs> I, I just I, I, I realized there was something amazingly cool about it, but I could not understand any of it. So I kind of rewatched it like five times, and it did not help. So I, uh, I bought a book about Scala, and I read half of it, and then like I rewatched it again, and then it was mostly fine. Yeah. But um, as a matter of fact, it turns out Scala is a pretty good language that I discovered randomly. And it actually ticked out of the boxes in my book. It was fast. Uh, it, it was parallel, so there were no deal, so you could do fun stuff with concurrency and parallelism. And it was typed. Uh, so many things were actually quite right. Many things. Um, and here comes the part you know, that, that I don't like. You know, Actually, the parts that I don't like about Scala have little to do with Scala itself. They're mostly um, all of the issues that we inherited by the fact that we are mostly a JVM language. Now, with Scala JS, of course, it's not true, but not so long ago, it was we were basically just a JVM-only language that kind of had all of the same issues that Java has. And I would call a JVM basically a golden cage because it's very, very nice and comfy. It has like basically everything you need. It's fast. 
It's really fast when, once it's warmed up. It's really fast if your code looks like, like after compilation, looks like Java code. And it's really fast if you are reasonable about your allocation rates. And as you could notice, there are lots and lots of bots, uh, so it's not all perfect. But it's really nice. Um, now another thing is that um, it's kind of like GVM is kind of a safe environment where people that build it were kind of like went to extreme of making it safe. Uh, they made it like so safe, so bulletproof that you could it, you would find a hard time doing something low level on JVM. And the only few APIs like Sun Misc and Safe are were never designed to be public. They were just happened to be available and people use them. And in fact, something like something more low level for high performance frameworks is often needed. And if you just uh, look around, like most high performance frameworks like Spark, most HTTP frameworks, like just about everybody uses unsafe because you cannot build a high performance system without having lower level primitives. And Java has this weird kind of like policy where safety is more important than expressivity and like, safety is the most exp important thing. And of course, you cannot talk to native code easily because that would undermine safety because native code is obviously not safe. So let's make talking to native code as hard as possible and just a bit harder afterwards, okay? And that's basically GNI, okay? And um, yeah, so I don't really have much to say about GNI apart from it being like a complicated mess that no one in their own sane mind would use. I think it was intentional, probably, because it's the only explanation how you can make something so complicated to solve such a simple problem. So now, uh, we know all the things I don't like, so let's kind of daydream a bit. Like, what would the things that would be nice to have? You know, I love daydreaming. I daydream a lot, and sometimes I d go so, so far into daydream world that I forget that stuff, uh, separation between stuff that I want and that don't exist, and stuff that exists, and, uh, and it's hard, you know? Like, I, I just want to use a feature which I, which I had in mind, but um, it's not there. So what kind of features are those? So first of all, for me personally, I don't care about JIT that much. I don't really uh, want my code to be slow for like 10, like for like a few seconds for, and the dependent code can be like 10 seconds to just warm up because JVM needed to interpret, uh, to collect the best profile information to compile the code the best way possible. You know, um, I don't really care about any of this. I just want my code to run when I say it to run. So if I say do work, I just want it to do work. I don't want it to warm up to do work, to do work. Um, I want to have value types. Uh, I really want uh, not to allocate sometimes. I don't really get this whole paradigm of not having any value types in, in language and a VM. Um, and I think Java is the only uh, a top used language, uh, top used compiled language that still doesn't have value types. And it's kind of really unfortunate. I want value types, I want to stack allocate things, I want it to be easy and effortless. And lastly, memory management. Of course we have GC. And because we don't have value types, GC is also all we have to kind of pass stuff around. And once you allocate something uh, on GC here, it's like, like super cheap. You just allocate stuff, it's like, allocation is immediately fast, it's amazing. Like, but at the same time, there's a very high cost of forgetting things. So the more you allocate, the more you, you remember, the more work you need to do to clean this mess up. You know, it, it's not free. So there is kind of non-trivial cost of allocating things on, G, on GC heap. And I would really want to kind of like have other options too. You know, GC is fine, and I think it's actually a kind of good uh, main paradigm for language, but it's not really, like if it's a, your only way, you're bound to uh, be using something like unsafe really fast. Uh, and lastly, I really kind of think that talking to native code should be a non-issue in 2016. Um, and, you know, it should not cause any performance overhead. It should not cause any mental overhead. You should just be able to call stuff. And it should not be ho horribly complicated. But it's kind of daydreaming, right? This, like, none of this exists. So, so we are back to our kind of like day jobs somewhere. And we are asked to like, kind of like to port some kind of like super important business application from C++. It's, um, <laughs> it's obviously kind of like um, 
very, very fast because it was hand optimized by the previous guy, you know. And so let's try to understand what, what it does, you know. So first we have this kind of struct. Is it big enough? I can make it bigger. No? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So first of all, we have this kind of struct uh, type. So what it is actually is just this three fields. It's a, a vector with three fields. And then we have some um, operations on it, like plus, minus, uh, multiply, uh, normalize, dot product, and so on and so forth. So these are kind of like n normal, messy operations on vectors. That's fine. That's kind of like still simple. We, we're not doing anything crazy yet. Then we have this struct ray that has uh, origin and destination, and it's basically an array in 3D space uh, that corresponds to whatever domain-specific lo logic we have, right? We don't understand any of this because we're just porting stuff over. It's fine. So then we have this um, enum, and we have more geometry. We have some global mutable state. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> Then we have some helpers, you know, um, again, some messy looking code, you know, just mess, you know, just uh, simple stuff, you just add stuff, subtract stuff, some for loop over here, nothing too special, you know, it's not some kind of, like, and here it goes. Um, and here it goes are basically business value of our products or something like that. Um, the most complicated and overblown kind of like piece of code like anywhere, it just, it's like hand optimized and so on and so forth, but it has to work exactly the way it is and you cannot change it, right? So. So let's kind of like just, um, so we can try to read it, but basically what it does, it has like three branches, it does different things based on this kind of flag uh, called ruffle, and it does different things, and actually this third piece is actually another branch. But we don't really care about what it does, we just need to port it to Scala because we are told to. Because Scala is a new popular language, you know, everything has to be in Scala. So obviously it's kind of like a, a very kind of like Non-trivial code, so we, we need to port it, like, you know. So we, we do our best, so we start porting, and we just map stuff to, like, normal Scala con constructs. So we don't have structs, so we'll have to use classes. Uh, so we cl have class vector with all of the same stuff we've seen before. We have class ray. We, we, we don't have enums in a language. Uh, yeah, so we emulate it with a int, and so we basically just port stuff over. There's nothing special about it. So we still have the state somewhere here, and we allocate everything on GC heap because we cannot allocate anywhere else. Uh, so most of the code just pours over just nicely. There are some funny parts where, uh, where we could, that we could do in C++ and we could not do here. For example, here we have these two variables, which are like this funny arrays of one element. And what we're trying to emulate is um, um, by reference arguments that we had in C++ codes. For example, here we had double T and int ID passed by reference. So we cannot do this, so we need to allocate a box. Might as well use array. We can also do something else. It doesn't really matter. So it, it, it's just a box that is passed over and uh, that is basically used to return more than one value at the same time. Then we port over all of our domain-specific code, hopefully not introducing any bugs. Uh, hopefully, yeah. And it's mostly just fine. So we don't use any of the fancy features. We just uh, use while loops instead of for loops because this code is like super important so we cannot really make it any slower. Um, so it's fine, right? Um, so now we are like mostly done here. So we ported like it all over. We even like run some like original tests and now it's like the hard time, you know. We need to make it as fast uh, as the previous one, right? So the previous code we, we compiled with um, Clang over here. Some warnings, it's fine. So it would do whatever it does. It would do whatever it does in something like 10 seconds, I think. Yeah, it has nice progress bar. It's nice, right? So like uh, seven seconds, actually. So, so that's fine. I mean, so we ported code over like faithfully, right? It has to be the same performance because JVM is really fast. That's true, right? Um, because we did not use a single Scala feature like, that is like, nice. We uh, used arrays. We, used, uh, uh, we, we didn't like, really do anything fancy. Like, we, we just ported stuff like, naively from one place to the other. It was basically the same thing, you know? Uh, but, like, so we, of course, we just compile it uh, and we run it. And, you know, and 
it's not quite as fast for some reason, you know? It's not quite exactly the same. I mean, we, ported, we, did, we did everything right. We didn't like, do anything like, uh, we didn't use for loops or didn't write functional code for, or anything scary. Like so, and, and our code is like twice slower now. What happened, you know? So then we, we can start kind of profiling and trying to figure out what's going on. And after a few kind of hours of, 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 of hitting your he head against the wall and trying to profile this code, we actually see that our like, uh, boxes over here and our kind of classes and set of structs over here and here are actually stressing GC. And they're like doing it like, really hard because we are basically have, we have like, the super important domain specific function in here called radiance. Uh, it's called like uh, 800 times, 600 times, four times. So whatever happens there happens a lot. So if we allocate two boxes like just here, uh, they actually kind of stress GC. And suddenly a code that would use the, just one core and uh, 10 megabytes of memory would easily use four cores and 100 megabytes of memory and, and be twice slower. That's, um, that's cool, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so then the question is like, so this is really important code, so we need to make it fast. And we need to make it fast like now, okay? So we can uh, do some fancy stuff, like we can try to use some misconce, we can allocate memory off heap. We can reuse allocations to remove this uh, GC pressure because we allocate lots of vectors when we compute stuff mathematically. We can try to reuse instances with like, all of this crazy stuff, you know, just this code was already kind of too ugly for me, you know, and like we can probably make it a bit faster and a bit uglier, but this kind of like, you know, defeats the point because actually this code in C++ wasn't that horrible if we think about it because it was fast and it was actually like it was as obvious and as clear and as easy to read as whatever we ported it to. We didn't make it nicer on the way. And what you're like, what people suggest me is kind of station just like, use some miscount safe and make it uglier, like, even uglier. Why would you want to make code uglier than whatever you had in C++, you know, this kind of, like, that's uh, not what we want. So you hit your head against the wall for, for a while, right? Because um, this kind of, like, issue that kind of doesn't really f fix itself, you know? And you try everything, it doesn't quite seem to work, like, people give you different advices how to make this code faster, but it's kind of, like, too hard, you know? All of it is just, uh, you know, you just have this feeling like maybe C++ is not a horrible language. And then you just realize what you just said, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So then, um, so what happens is just like you go somewhere in Switzerland in some village and just isolate yourself from the rest of the world for nine months and hack. Um, and, and hopefully like nine months later you have something else to show, right? Hopefully. So here is this, this something else, something hopefully. So as you can see, it has this Scala native.native import and on top. And it means we are doing something else. We are not doing exactly the same thing we did before. So actually, we have this kind of like add struct annotation now. It came from this underscore import. Uh, and it probably does something to make, to make, to make it faster. But like, oh, let's keep reading. So, so we made everything struct. Um, we made everything struct, so it's hopefully it will not cause any GC pressure. We also have this extern thing. It calls, uh, it looks like some signature for some C function somewhere. Um, probably some kind of interop layer, I don't know, yeah. Uh, but like, our fancy global mutable state is, is now just allocated in a non-GC heap, just easily. And basically it's almost the same code with some minor changes. And remember our like tight spot before over here, where we had new array of one element, we have this like fancy stack allocate of T now. So we can just stack allocate something up, you know, again, not to stress the GC. And in the end, we basically have almost the same code, you know. If, if we would diff it, it would just have a very minor kind of like uh, differences here and there, mostly the same code. So, but like, um, shall we run it? So I compiled it before because compilation, like we don't benchmark compilation, but basically it just, um, it runs. It doesn't look too slow. Definitely looks faster than previous one. So let's see. Oh, now it's like 8.7 seconds versus uh, 7 seconds on C++ and, and 14, almost 15 seconds for Java. So I guess that's not too bad. I mean, I, I would definitely see a kind of like 
going with this, you know, just like 20% slower. That's not too bad, I guess. We can roll with it, you know. And, and actually, it still uses the same amount of resources as C++ app. It still does not allocate anything on GHeap. We allocate everything either manually or st stack allocated. And it actually basically has the same performance profile as C++ code with some minor slowdown. I guess that's not too high price to pay. And it's pretty nice. We didn't really change much code, right? That's good. Now, I, um, so I probably confused you more than kind of an answer uh, with this kind of demo. And here I'll just like quickly answer all of the questions that people just asked me before. And there are kind of like lots of them, right? So first of all, is it based on LLVM? Well, yeah, of course. What else would you base it on? It's like the only reasonable choice for an ahead of time compiler for Scala, and that's what it is. Uh, can't optimize tail codes, someone asked me on Twitter. Yeah, it can optimize tail codes. LVM is pretty good at optimizing them, and it can also do mutual tail calls. So that's nice. That's very good. Is it the same language? Um, well, mostly it's the same language plus the extra stuff that they really wanted, like pointers and structs and and others like stuff like st stack allocate. And it's basically Scala with a bit more low level feel to it. Is it just a backend, you know? Because nowadays all backends look like this, right? So you have a compiler and part of the compiler is backend, right? It's kind of like, but not really because this kind of like approach doesn't really scale if you want to do anything non-trivial. So how it looks in, in practice is actually a bit more complicated because you would really want to support more than one front end. You would want uh, both Scala C and Dota to benefit from this nice stuff. And for this, you need a, a front end, back end, and something in between to communicate between the two. And so we have like this kind of like a bit more complicated scheme where we, just, where we compile first to IR, then we assemble it together and com compile the whole app to LVM. And as you can see, in Dota you have this nice fancy LTO thingy. Uh, see, it's kind of it's kind of a bit different from what we have for Scala C. And this one is because of the like new fancy Dota linker by Dimitri. And you know this whole image is going to be even fancier like with over time with domain specific optimizations and so on and so forth. Um, is it garbage collected? So what I've showed you is basically like I'll allocate everything manually. Do you have to do this? Of course not. Like. Scala is garbage collected language, and it's going to stay garbage collected for observable periods of time. Um, so, first release of Scala native, whenever it happens, is, is going to be with BoMGC, and it can only get better from there, you know. Um, yeah. So, what kind of hardware do we support? So, we compiled native code. It means our like f final output is native binary, and the answer is we, we currently develop on Intel 64-bit. We've had a lot of re requests for ARM, both 32 and 64-bit, and this is something that people are interested in. So library support. What kind of libraries can you use on Scala Native? So first of all, whatever you have on C in any way, either standard or non-standard, you can use easily. As, as we've seen before, this external object thing, it just lets you to just define a signature for C function and just call it for fuck's sake. You don't, you don't need to make this, all of this a ceremony about um, GNI about about trying to kind of like have multiple layers of signatures, uh, one on Java side, one on C side, and so on and so forth. So it should be like easy and this easy. And of course, we Scala has a reasonably small um, standard library, and so we have a subset of Java libraries built in, some small subset that people actually care about. So if something is not there and you care about it, in a, so just come to us and tell us, and we'll probably add it. Is it open source? Yeah, it is open source, like now. Yay. No, not this one. <laughs> Let me do it. <laughs> yeah, it should be public now. Okay. Okay. Okay, so is it released yet? 
Uh, yeah, S slow down with clapping, yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, not yet. Um, and it's going to be ready, like, one day in the near future. I will not say any kind of, like, stupid things, like, in one month or anything like this. So I I've never said this, or I'm not saying this. And uh, So we we're going to release it when it's ready. So we have Twitter account where you can follow us and get latest updates on what's going on. We have milestones on GitHub, so you can also follow those that give you some indication of, of what's going on around. Thanks. Questions? Uh, what, what kind of subset of the Scala standard library works? Because so much of the standard library sort of inherits semantics from Java, right. which, was, which was a problem back in the MSIL days, but like, yep. it's still a problem now. So uh, basically, everything is used for standard library. We'll, we, when I say everything, I mean everything in re reasonable like for collections and so on and so forth. We would expect to have on the first release, so we already have a small subset of, of Java libraries implemented. So it, like whatever kind of ha whatever we happen to depend on in Scala library, most likely would be implemented in Java uh, in Java library subset. So this should not be an, an issue. Some parts are not supported. Uh, what parts exactly are not supported is kind of like a, a question to be discussed. But mostly, like, normal Scala looking code like collections and stuff should just work. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, how do you debug? Uh, so, so right now, so basically, on LLVM, like on JVM, we use JVM debuggers, and they're nice. You know, they kind of like give you a reasonably high-level view of code. Uh, on LLVM, you can debug with LLDB. It's a LLVM debugger that kind of like takes advantage of LLVM uh, representation and knows about it. Currently, we don't emit uh, symbols necessary to make it super nice. In the future, we'll uh, emit uh, necessary. Opposition information about uh, for code so that you could just step in in a LDB. So LDB is kind of like a, our strategy in, in, in that space. Yeah. Uh, so how can you make entry points into uh, the Scala code from that you can call from C, for example, make a library uh, writing the Scala code and so, so you want to call from uh, C to Scala. Uh, so we have this extern object, and if you use C++ and C++, you have this extern scopes, and the two are very similar. So basically, it's, it's kind of like this should not answer your question, I think. So if you say extern object and you define stuff there, it's extern. Yeah. So uh, how about dealing with like callbacks? A lot of C libraries want callbacks, right? They take function pointers or things like that. Like how how do you deal with that? We'll have function pointers. <laughs> what about concurrency and thread pools? Uh, so, so first release is going to be um, not parallel but concurrent. So we will not have a, a, a multiple threads from day one. Uh, it's an implementation of restrictions and we'll never release one zero without uh, parallelism, of course. That's kind of sometime in the future will happen, hopefully. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, okay. Mike is going in that direction, I think. Yeah. Have you thought about of, uh, or have you seen any situations where, for example, the stack allocation call that you were doing in one of your functions, could that, have you seen a situation where maybe the compiler can determine whether that can be a stack allocated yep. so that you don't have to call it explicitly? I see what you mean. Uh, so, so what you're saying is, can compiler automatically stack allocate stuff so that we don't have to? And the answer is, JVM compiler already tries to do that on JVM. And, but the question is, it doesn't always work the way it's supposed to be, because it, it's dependent on analysis to make sure that you cannot just stack allocate stuff randomly. So you need to do an analysis to make sure that whatever like, you stack allocate that doesn't escape for some definition of escape, so it, it's safe. With this new APIs, you can kind of like say, I know what I'm doing, so it's fine. So you, like, you, don't, you don't need to be paranoid about it, but it's really hard to make it work for every single case when it's a compiler optimization. In some cases, well, sure, a comp compiler might be able to stack allocate things. But for example, here we can see on JVM, if you profile the code we had, like the second code, it cannot stack allocate neither vectors nor um, arrays of one element. Because just an analysis did not quite work the way it's supposed to. I mean. Yeah. 
Uh, Over here? Oh. Hello? Uh, Okay. Someone... Keep going left. Left? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, What are the startup costs associated with, like, starting a JVM instance versus LLVM from a time perspective? Of course. Uh, Of course, uh, startup is an issue. Um, It's kind of the whole point of of Scala Native of not having this issue, basically. So, uh, in some cases... um, But, again, here the main issue was not startup time because... We are basically just stressing GC here. In a, so, kind of main issue here is not startup time. It definitely make it look even worse because of, of, of VM startup time. Yeah. Uh, do you have a feel for what accounts for that 20% difference uh, still? Uh, yeah, I, I think I have like a, there are a number of features in Scala which we sort of like need to optimize before LLVM because LLVM is not cannot perfectly handle it for us. For example. Um, we don't have top-level functions like in C. So whenever we call um, a function in a module, you actually need to check that it's initialized. You know, like modules are lazily initialized, and I think it's one of the causes for where we see a slowdown because our code is in, is in, in objects, and whenever you do a, a, a call there, it, it has a potential uh, extra check. I think it might be possible to remove that gap, but I, I will not promise you anything. Hi. Uh, a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, do you think uh, this will open the door for iOS development, uh, given that you can compile to LLVM? And uh, we use that there, too. And the other one was, uh, what about things that depend on threads, like thread pools, executor services, that are libraries or code that we have today yeah, that are tied uh, to the Java ecosystem? Okay. So for iOS, the answer is, like, once we have uh, tested and kind of, like, published, deployed, and kind of like approved ARM support. Um, basically, Scala Native from LLVM point of view, from a tool chain like after us, looks like any other C app. So it does, doesn't do anything completely crazy. So uh, if you can build something with Clang somewhere, it's foreseeable that you can port uh, Scala Native to, to this platform. And ARM, in particular, has been uh, of great interest to many people, so it's, it's likely it will prob- we'll prioritize uh, that on the list of platforms we would like support. But of course, uh, uh, at first we'll have just Intel, but in the future we'll d- this list will hopefully grow. Uh, and speaking about thread pools, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, like um, second question about thread pools and so on and so forth. So right now we are single thread from a thread point of view, you can have concurrency, and you can even try to use Java-Lang thread, but it, it will not do anything meaningful to you. Um, but the question is like, what kind of like parallel story are we going to have? It's kind of like open question for next release, so I cannot really kind of like um, say anything there. How's the exception handling like, um, especially the undefined behavior? Oh, undefined behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so all of the unsafe features will have undefined behavior similar to what we have in C. So basically, whatever is undefined in C will probably will probably be undefined in Scala Native, like. If you do something crazy with pointers and that is not safe, it will be not safe because obviously it's not it's not a kind of bulletproof API. This is why it's, it, it, it 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 gives us benefits because we don't need to check at runtime anything, right? So we will definitely have undefined behavior around unsafe features. Yes. So there's still null pointer then. <laughs> um, yeah, especially kind of like if you reference a pointer of t, it's undefined behavior if it's not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the two examples, one looks like it's uh, written for the JVM, the other example is written for the LL. Yeah. Are you going to have it where you can have the same code source and compile it either way? So, as I said before, the goal is to have the same language, so we don't try to have a different language. So whatever we kind of add is just a strictly an addition. So whatever, whatever was there in Scala before as it is now today, we are, it's our goal to but to keep it the way it is. So you can also run the second code if you want to, so it's fine. Yep. Yep. So um, right now we're in a situation with Scala.js where um, all of the projects, especially upstream dependencies like you know, ScalaZ or, or Shapeless or something like that, um, you know, if people want to use them with both 
you know, Scala on the JVM and Scala JS, those upstream libraries have to be compiled with both. Right. Um, is this is this just sort of adding adding to that problem? Do you see yeah. any way to get around this? So right now we sort of add into this problem, and it's going to be like need, like if you want really cross uh, platform library, you will need to publish for JVM, JS, and, and native. But hopefully with Dotty, it's going to be better with Hasty. But um, again, it's kind of like uh, in the future. So hopefully, maybe we'll be able to just publish Tasty, and everybody will be happy about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, for sure, but it's kind of a future I want to see. Yeah. Any more questions? Any options to interoperate with C++ code? <laughs> yeah. I knew this question would happen, yeah. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, we can interop with extern C parts of C++. So if you, if you export anything with extern C, uh, and if you kind of like, we can all, like, the same way as, as you would like do it if you want to interop between C and C++. You can, you can do extern C, wrap everything into a helper function on C++ side, and then you can use it from Scala Native. You cannot directly use mangled names from C++ from Scala Native. Okay, over there. Uh, what about uh, something like OpenCL? Can you call that from Scala? So, as far as I know, OpenCL is primarily uh, exposed as C API. If it's a C API, you can call it. Uh, can you generate Scala to OpenCL? That's kind of not as out of scope of, of the project, so we are definitely not doing that. Any more questions? Okay. Well, because, uh, like, you know. Oh, okay. So the question is uh, why do we want to support both Scala C and Dotty? Well, because I think one of the good questions, to, one of the good answers to this question is basically this LTO part that is developed by Dimitri. It kind of promises you to have more domain specific and language specific optimizations. So, in Scala Native, we also kind of slightly optimize your code, but we really want to be fast to compile. We, it's not our purpose to be f fastest to compile. In LTO, Dimitri tries to kind of like really get the best out of your code possible, assuming Scala semantics and assuming even domain-specific knowledge about libraries like uh, collection libraries and so on and so forth. We are definitely, it, it doesn't look like we are going to get this on, on Scala C, so it definitely makes sense to have both. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, what primitive types are going to be supported? So for instance, or is there going to be support for like unsigned int, unsigned long? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess no more questions? OK, another one. So, so what do you do with things like string and stuff that are already going into C now and for like the, the base Java stuff? How, how is that? So we have uh, like, so whatever we had before, like all of the Java stuff, like Java like string, we, all, we still have it. And whatever C has, we still have it. And these two are separate. So when you write a, a, a string literal in Scala, it's a Java style string. And you also have uh, C style strings and you, have, you even have a special literal syntax for those. So you can actually create either of those, but depending on, on on what you want. And of course, you can convert between the two. But two are different, are not the same, yeah, because they have different memory layout. Yeah. So I saw in the example that you have a stack allocated uh, uh, box type. Yeah. And you had also mentioned GC heap. Do you have non GC heap available? I mean, malloc is not non GC heap. And do you allow uh, references back and forth between the different heaps? No, no. So it's the same restrictions on, as on JVM in this part, but you can do more of heap now. So it's kind of like um, references back are kind of like impossible because like you, you cannot really you do, you do not want to traverse uh, non GC heap to do a GC because that would 
uh, defies the whole point, so you actually have to have this restriction. But if you use unsafe features, you might hack your way through, but that's kind of like unsafe, unsound, unsupported, okay? <laughs> yeah? Okay, no more questions, that's nice. Okay, cool.